starting tonight's program with an oil roundtable. The black gold's been the economic backbone of our region for decades, with the GCC home to over one third of the world's proven crude oil reserves. Now, regional unrest has led to great opportunity and challenges for the industry. And innovation is leading to more of the stuff being discovered and extracted than ever before. Or joining us now in the studio to tell us more are two of the region's brightest oil mines. We're joined by Major Jaffa, the CEO of Sharjah's Crescent Petroleum, the oldest private oil company in the Middle East, and a board member of its affiliate Dana Gas, which is listed on the Abu Dhabi Exchange. And alongside him is Robin Mills, an expert on oil economics and the head of consulting for Manor Energy Consulting. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening. To be thank here. You. Great to have you here. Major, I'm going to begin by asking you now, and Dana Gas, of course, which Crescent Petroleum is the largest shareholder for, have recently seen their profits jump by around 20%, and that's certainly been due in part to the fact we're now seeing payments coming from Egypt, coming from the Kurdish part of Iraq, after some delays for a few years. So what are the challenges involved in doing business in these kinds of countries today? Well, clearly the region's seen a lot of changes in the last couple of years and countries that may have been seen as stable like Egypt a few years ago, now there's some turmoil and delays in payments. Other areas like the Kurdistan region of Iraq where we're the largest investor and cumulative producer uh, had been seen as a high risk area only a few years ago and now is very popular with uh, oil and gas companies in the region. But as a regional player we take a long term uh, outlook and we have to be conservative with our cash as well. Mm, there's certainly some huge expansion plans there which I'll ask you about in just a moment. Robin, I know you've of course been a frequent visitor to Iraq. You were there for some time last year. You were even there last week as well. How do you see the market progressing there, both in terms of the opportunities but the difficulties as well? Well, you know, Iraq for me, it's just a huge story. It's clearly the biggest story right now in Middle East oil, you know, both in the Kurdish region and in, in the central and southern Iraq and it's going to see the most investment and, and all going well. It, it will be the biggest increase in production, um, certainly in the Middle East and pretty much anywhere else in the world, uh, with the possible exception of the US. So it's a huge story. Nobody doubts the oil resources, and I think, you know, what's interesting we've seen in the past few years that the Kurdish region, which was always kind of written off and didn't get much attention, is now seen as uh, having great potential too. And of course, you know, as Majid's uh, Crescent Petroleum was found and, and others. But the south of Iraq is where the bulk of resources are. Um, and that's seeing a huge amount of development, but very big challenges on security, logistics, uh, politics, and so on. Mm -hmm. It's obviously easier said than done overcoming those challenges. Major, this is obviously a huge area of great expansion for you. Where are you looking at today? Will Iraq be the biggest cornerstone for Crescent Petroleum going forward? Well, it will be a big uh, growth area, uh, Katie, and we're, we feel well placed as regional players to manage the risks, to handle the logistics, security challenges. But above all, particularly for southern Iraq and the federal government, they have to get the right policy in place. They have to have investment type agreements that actually create the right incentives for the investors over the long term. We haven't seen that yet. The promises of six million barrels a day by 2012 obviously haven't materialized. And the oil law that was meant to underpin uh, that policy is not yet in place. The North, uh, the Kurdistan region has those things in place and there has, has been better uh, progress there, albeit from a smaller base, uh, as uh, Robin was pointing out. So what needs to be put in place? What kind of uh, timeline do you think is realistically uh, realistic before you feel more confident uh, about putting these, uh, putting these UAE uh, dirhams into Iraq? Well, we're, we're, we're confident about the potential, but obviously the, the, the contracts, the terms must be right. That's above all what the oil and gas uh, business needs anywhere or any yeah. business. We can handle the logistics and, and the security uh, challenges. And there needs to be a consensus in the whole of Iraq on the right policy and a pro-investment type approach to maximize revenues. Unfortunately, some of the mindset, particularly in the federal government, is still of the old state centric state control uh, and there's been bureaucracy and there's been the wrong sorts of contracts but we're hoping that, that those changes will be made because as Robin points out it's Iraq possibly has the biggest oil reserves in the world and the potential needs to be realized not only for Iraq 
but for the whole world oil markets. Mm -hmm. And actually, I wanted to ask you a little bit uh, more about that, particularly for golf potential at the moment. Uh, Majid, you've said previously that the end of easy oil is actually a beneficial thing for the Middle East. It's actually meaning that more smaller and mid-sized players like Crescent Petroleum, that there uh, is some, uh, some great potential there as well. How do you try to plan and capitalize on that? Well, the region has still, of course, a lot of conventional oil and gas reserves. We have 60% of the world's oil and 40% of the world's gas, at least, possibly even more than that, because it's relatively underexplored. But the big uh, giant uh, fields, with the exception of Iraq, have largely been developed. There needs to be development, particularly in gas exploration, and in the midstream and the downstream, and some of these areas where you have big complex project with management uh, needs, links to industry where commercial skills become important and a cross-border element involving exports are areas where the private sector can play a role and we feel as the regional private sector uh, can in, in, you know, in particular play uh, a role where some of the large majors it doesn't make sense anymore. Robert, what are your thoughts in terms of obviously these big major players as well as the smaller private players as well? What kind of potential is there? Obviously a lot of companies are trying to diversify nowadays. Well, absolutely. You know, you know I look at the US where the small companies have been very, very successful in leading the development of new kinds of resources, shale, oil, shale, gas and so on. And I also look at Norway. I was in Norway at the end of last year. And what Norway has done very well is to build a a whole ecosystem of small and medium-sized service companies, so people who are doing engineering, doing studies, all this kind of support stuff for the oil industry. And that's what really creates employment. I mean, oil companies do not employ that many people, um, but the service industry uh, and, and the smaller kind of ecosystem of these, these companies, that can employ a lot of people, and it creates technology which will lead to long, uh, lasting employment for decades and decades. So I think you know, that's where the private sector really has a big role to are play Are we seeing here. that happen enough here, just quickly? I think we're seeing it emerge to some extent, you know, and there are some good service companies in the UAE and, uh, and starting to come up and in Saudi Arabia, for example, as well. Um, but it's still early days and we just need to, to see a lot more of that happening. Absolutely. Well, hopefully we do see more of that happen. Gentlemen, I hope you can stay with me after the break. A few more things to ask you.